Mithraism. The image depicts tauroctony, or bull killing, a modern name given to the central cult reliefs of the Roman Mithraic mysteries. Okay. The mystery cults of Greco-Roman antiquity included the Eleusinian Mysteries, the Dionysian Mysteries, and the Orphic Mysteries. Mithraism, also known as the Mith Mithraic Mysteries, was a Roman mystery religion centered on the god Mithras. Though Mithraism was inspired by Persian worship of Mithra and a cult attributed to Zoroaster, the level of continuity between Persian and Greco-Roman practice is debated. The mysteries, which appear to have had its center in Rome, were popular among the Roman military from about the 1st to the 4th century AD, <clears throat> and was popular throughout the western half of the empire, as far south as Roman Africa and Numidia, as far north as Roman Britain, and to a lesser extent in Roman Syria in the east. Worshippers of Mithras who have often been compared to an early form of Freemasonry, had a complex system of seven grades of initiation and communal ritual meals. Initiates call themselves syndexioi, those united by the handshake. They met in underground temples, now called Mithraea, which survive in large numbers. The iconic scenes of Mithraea show Mithras, wearing a Phrygian cap and being born from a rock, slaughtering a bull, and sharing a banquet with the god Sol, the sun. A dog and a snake reach up towards the blood. A scorpion seizes the bull's genitals. A raven is flying around or is sitting on the bull. Three ears of wheat are seen coming out from the bull's tail sometimes from the wound. The two torchbearers are on either side, dressed like Mithras. Cautes with his torch pointing up and Cautopates with his torch pointing down. Is that what's going on here in this image? The image is incident of the myth of Phaethon on relief in a Mithraeum at Deburg. Mithras is often paired with the goddess Anahita. Other figures include Saturn and Jupiter, and symbols of the constellations of the zodiac are very prominent. Following the slaughter of the bull, Mithras banquets on the flesh of the bull with the sun god Helios, with whom he ascends to the sky, riding his chariot drawn by four horses. Though scholars have not readily accepted Spidel's theory that Mithras is the constellation Orion, in support of his theory, Spidel points out that Manilius proclaims for Orion, under him as their leader, the constellations orbit through all of the sky. As well, according to Porphyry, Mithras is placed near the celestial equator, comprehending the northern parts on his right and the southern on his left hand. Orion, the dog, the raven, the cup, the snake, and the ears of corn were the constellations along the equator between Taurus and Scorpio. The animals surrounding the scene represent the evil creatures, Ahriman swallowing up the life-giving energies issuing from the bull as well as the four elements. A raven hovers above, a snake slithers nearby, a scorpion attacks the bull's genitals, and a dog leaps at the bull's wound. In some cases, a lion is added to the scenery, and the serpent slithers towards the cup. The torchbearers associated with Taurus and Scorpio are related to the summer and winter. While they purportedly derived from the Zoroastrian Magi, the mysteries of Mithras as practiced during the Roman period also borrowed from the philosophy of Plato in the development of its rites and symbols, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica.
the myth was interpreted by the Roman Mithraists in terms of Platonic philosophy. The sacrifice took place in a cave, an image of the world as in the simile of the cave in Plato's Republic. Mithra himself was equated with the creator or demiurge of the Timaeus. He was called demiurge and father of all things, like the Platonic demiurge. The four elements, the mixing bowl, the creation of time, and the attack of the wicked animals upon the newborn creature are well-known features of the Timaeus. The Mithraic doctrine of the soul is intimately linked with the myth of creation and with Platonic philosophy. As in the Timaeus, the soul of man came down from heaven. It crossed the seven spheres of the planets, taking on their vices, e.g. those of Mars and of Venus, and was finally caught within the body. The task of man is to liberate his divine part, the soul, from the shackles of the body and to reascend through the seven spheres to the eternal, unchanging to the eternal unchanging realm of the fixed stars. This ascension to the sky was prefigured by Mithra himself when he left the earth in a chariot of the sun god. You know, a lot of this imagery uh, reminds me of the tarot. And you can watch my uh, Crowley uh, Book of Toth series. It talks all about the tarot and Kabbalah. It ties a lot of this stuff together. Really amazing how uh, all these different series are kind of being tied together by this Ordo Abkeo. Mithraism seems to have been a combination of Zervanite Zoroastrianism and Chaldean astrology centered around the worship of Mithras, who through his assimilation to Bel became a dying god. Therefore, he was associated with the return of fertility in the spring as represented in the most common scene of Mithraism, where Mithras is depicted slaying a bull, out of which sticks of wheat are seen to issue from its tail and from its wound. Essentially, Mithras is a savior figure who, after the great conflagration of the world at the end of the great year, recreates the cosmos through the sacrifice of the bull. The slaying of the bull was also known to the Avesta, where at the end of time, Seoshiant, the Zoroastrian savior, assists the good in its conquest over evil. When the dead rise from their graves, according to the Bundhas, Bund, uh, sorry, Bundhisen, Bundhisen, the Savior will slay the magnificent bull and serve mankind an ambrosia mixed from its fat and the juice of the haoma. Commonly in Mithraic iconography, the tail of the bull ends in ears of corn. From its blood springs forth the first ears of grain and the grape, and from its genitals issued the holy seed, which was received by a mixing bowl. The cup, or mixing bowl, is the constellation Crater and the sacred bowl of the mysteries, from which the initiate drinks the intoxicating wine or the blood of the god in order to imbibe the knowledge of hidden things. Likewise, to the Dionysiacs and Orphics, Dionysus was the grapevine, and the Bacchanals received his divine nature in a cup. The cup is the receptacle first outlined in Plato's Timaeus, in which the four elements were mixed to create the universe. Furthermore, according to Macrobius, Plato speaks of this in the Phaedo, and says that the soul is dragged back into the body, hurried on by new intoxication, desiring to taste a fresh draft of the overflow of matter, whereby it is weighted down and brought back to earth. The cosmic crater of Father Liber, or Dionysus, is a symbol of this mystery, and this is what the ancients, ca the ancients called the River of Leaf, the Orphics saying that Father Lieber was Heilic Mind. Again, we've seen this image of the Bacchanalia. This 
seen this or something similar to the uh, Zodiac image here. Floor mosaic of the Beth Alpha Synagogue near Beit She'an, Israel. The Dionysiac symbolism of the wine cup, the sacred bowl carrying the blood of the god, familiar to Mithraism and other mystical systems, had a strong presence in early Jewish synagogue art. As Edwin Goodenough pointed out in his classic work, Jewish Symbols in the Greco-Roman Period, wine symbols were the most prominent of any kind, including vintage scenes, <coughs> vines, bunches of grapes, the wine cup or the cup as a fountain, and therefore it was plain that we had a great amount of Jewish art from the period, and that this art was elaborately Dionysiac, had indeed the same vocabulary of Dionysiac borrowing as that used by the early Christians. The central image of the ancient synagogues was composed of a circle of the zodiac, containing segmented rings within squares, with figures representing the, the seasons in the corners, and in the center, Helios, riding a chariot drawn by four horses. Celsus, a Roman writer of the 2nd century AD, compared the system of Mithraism to Plato's belief that souls ascend through the planets. Thus, Celsus explained, These truths are obscurely represented by the teaching of the Persians and by the mystery of Mithras, which is of Persian origin. For in the latter there is a symbol of the two orbits in heaven, the one being that of the fixed stars and the other that assigned to the planets, and of the soul's passage through these. The symbol is this. There is a ladder with seven gates and at its top an eighth gate. The first of the gates is of lead, the second of tin, the third of bronze, the fourth iron, the fifth of an alloy, the sixth of silver, and the seventh of gold. They associate the first with Kronos, Saturn, taking lead to refer to the slowness of the star, the second with Aphrodite or Venus, comparing her with the brightness and softness of tin, the third with Zeus or Jupiter as the gate that has a bronze base and which is firm. The fourth with Hermes or Mercury, for both iron and Hermes are reliable for all works and make money and are hard working. The fifth with Aries or Mars, the gate which as a result of the mixture is uneven and varied in quality. The sixth with the moon as the silver gate and the seventh with the sun as the golden gate. These metals resembling their color. The alchemical process of creating the philosopher's stone to Zosimos is the Mithraic mystery, the incommunicable mystery. Essentially, the alchemists employed the language of chemical procedures as allegory. Converting lead into gold implied the purification of the soul by removing successive levels of impurity, beginning with lead, which, according to the Mithraic system described by Celsus, is the first gate the planet Saturn, then ascending through the six other planets, culminating in the sun symbolized by gold. Thus, as Lindsay maintained, explaining alchemy according to the system popularized by Numenius, the soul in its ascent was thought to give back the qualities it had absorbed at each stage of its descent. Thus, each halt was a sort of transmutation in terms of the relevant metal after the seventh change came the absorption into the luminous bliss of the eighth sphere. Having come down from Ahura Mazda's presence by the low gate of the crab, the soul went up by the lofty gate of Capricorn. Origen, who at his disposal diagrams of the Ophites, was able to confirm Celsus's comparison of the seven archons of the Ophite Gnostics with the teachings of Mithraism. The first four forms approximate the four creatures approximate the four creatures of the vision of Ezekiel. The first is in the shape of a lion, 
and equated with the archangel Michael. The second is a bull equated with Cereal. The third was a serpent that hissed dreadfully and was equated with Raphael. And the fourth is in the form of an eagle and is equated with Gabriel. The highest secret of the mysteries, according to Kumant, is the identity of Mithras as the Leontocephalus, a lion-headed figure with two sets of wings and cloven feet standing on a globe with two intersecting circles and entwined by a serpent. The imagery is a combination of the creatures of Ezekiel's vision of the throne of God, ultimately reserved for the highest-ranking members of the mysteries and representing the ultimate mystery, the Leontocephalus, represented Saturn, who was equated with Mithras, Zervan, and Ariman, Phanes, and Hades, the god of the underworld, all as one god. <clears throat> Macrobius recorded that, according to Orpheus, one Zeus, one Hades, one Sun, one Dionysus, and according to Ptolemy, the people of Persia and Mesopotamia worshipped the star of Aphrodite, or Venus, naming it Isis, and the star of Kronos, or Saturn, as Mithras Helios. Saturn was also worshipped as Zervan among the ancient heretical Zoroastrian Magi, known as the nocturnal sun and equated with Kronos. Uh, going back to the image here of Mithras, the lion head Mithras or Leontocephalus mirroring the creatures of Ezekiel standing on a wheel inside a wheel. Here he is. And where were we? Pluto, the Roman equivalent of Hades, Porphyry explained, is the sun god going beneath the earth and voyaging round the invisible world. In the mysteries of Mithras, like in alchemy, Saturn was represented by lead, where the ascent of the mystic or his transmutation began, and which ended with union with the sun, equated with the dying god or Lucifer. Church Fathers. Here in this image is the Council of Nicaea, 325 AD. The Roman Emperor Septimus Severus married Julia Domna, daughter of Julius Bassianus, the priest king of Emesa, who was descended from Gaius Julius Alexo, the son of Sohamus of Emesa and Drusilla of Mauritania. In approximately 217 AD, Philostratus composed the life of Apollonius at the request of Julia Domna, who possessed documents belonging to Damis of Nineveh, a disciple and companion of Apollonius of Tyana. Another famous descendant of the priest kings of Emesa was the noted Neoplatonic philosopher Iamblichus. Septimus Severus was succeeded by his son Caracalla, but in 217 AD, Caracalla was killed and Macrinus ascended to the imperial throne. His cousin, Julia Soemius, the daughter of Julia Domna's sister, Julia Mesa, would not allow the usurper to stand unopposed. Together with her mother, Julia, she plotted to substitute Macrinus with her son, Marcus Aurelius, and Antoninus, who appropriated the name Elagabalus. In 218 AD, Macrinus was killed and Elagabalus became emperor. Elagab I'm, hoping, I'm not saying it right, probably. Elagabalus replaced Jupiter, head of the Roman pantheon, with the cult of Sol Invictus, which was harmonized with the cult of Mithras. Herodian relates that Elagabalus forced senators to watch 
while he danced around the deity's altar to the sound of drums and cymbals, and at each summer solstice celebrated a great festival. Here's an image of Septimus Severus. And, uh, sorry, these coins, Roman Aureus depicting Elijah Ballas. The reverse reads, Sanct Dio Soli Elijah Bal, to the holy sun god, and depicts a four-horse gold chariot carrying the holy stone of the Emesa temple. Herodian's description strongly suggests that the cult of Emesa was inspired by the Babylonian Akitu festival. Their rule was not popular, and soon discontent arose, as Elijah Ballas, maybe, uh, developed a reputation among, among his contemporaries for eccentricity, decadence, and zealotry. The creed of Jesus as Son and God was finally formalized and instituted as an Orthodox tenant at the Council of Nicaea, which was personally summoned by Constantine on 325 AD. Constantine was the last in a long line of rulers belonging to the Mithraic bloodline and a descendant of Septimus Severus. Then we have these coins here. Constantine Phallus with Sol Invictus. Whatever that means. Okay. Where did I just leave off? Okay. Right. When Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the empire, he completed the project incepted by Herod the Great to subvert the emerging Christian movement by corrupting it into disguised Mithras worship. The worship of Sol Invictus was continued by Constantine, who some think never converted to Christianity. In 321, Constantine instructed that Christians and non-Christians should be united in observing the venerable day of the sun, or Sunday, Refer referencing the sun worship that Aurelian had established as an official cult. Constantine's coinage continued to carry the symbols of the sun, even when Constantine dedicated the new capital of Constantinople. He did so wearing the Apollonian sun raid diadem, or diadem. Here is the Battle of Milvian Bridge in 312 AD. Epic. You can see Constantine there on the left in gold on a horse. Immediately before his victory at the Battle of Milvian Bridge in 312 AD, Constantine is said to have had a vision of, the ra of a radiant cross suspended in the sky upon which was inscribed, <clears throat> By this sign you will conquer. In response, Constantine ordered the shields of his troops emblazoned with the Christian monogram known as the Labarum, a wheel-shaped sign formed by the first two letters of the words Christos and X or Key, placed in front of <coughs> uh, a P or Rho, the Greek letters Key Rho. The letter Key was used by the Greeks as a solar symbol, and the abbreviation of the Greek name for Saturn, Kronos, was the wheel-shaped sign formed by the first two letters combined, uh, a key placed in front of a row. Here's the, an image of Kiro on a plaque of sarcophagus, 4th century CE. In Plato's Timaeus, Key symbolizes the intersection of the earthly and celestial equators, the wheel inside a wheel of Ezekiel's vision, and the Leontocephalus of Mithraism. This passage in the Timaeus, known as the Psychogonia, was the source of much comment by the Neoplatonists and others, and Justin Martyr in his Apologia Consider that Plato interpreted his key from the brazen serpents that Moses had erected as a sign in the form of a cross. Saturnalia. And the image is Saturnalia by Antoine Calais, or Calet. Good. 
In common with Jesus, Mithras was born in a cave surrounded by animals and shepherds at the winter solstice in December, dates that had specific astronomical significance. In the Julian calendar, the 25th of December was reckoned the winter solstice and was regarded as the nativity of the sun because from this date the length of the day began to increase and therefore was regarded as the day of the rebirth of the sun god and the rejuvenation of life. The Gospels, however, say nothing as to the day of Christ's birth, and accordingly the early church did not celebrate it. In time, though, the Christians of Egypt had come to regard the 6th of January as the birth of the Savior, and that date gradually spread until by the 4th century A.D. it was universally established in the East. Finally, however, at the end of the 3rd or the beginning of the 4th century A.D., the Western Church, which had never recognized the 6th of January as the day of the Nativity, adopted the 25th of December as the true date. The later Roman Empire celebrated the Dies Natalis of Sol Invictus, the Nativity of the Unconquerable Sun, on December 25th. It was preceded by the Roman festival of the Saturnalia, which, according to James Fraser, was an accommodation of a more ancient Babylonian ritual of Zagmuk. The Roman playwright Asius <laughs> traced the Saturnalia to the ancient Greek festival of the Cronia, dedicated to Cronus. In the Saturnalia of Macrobius, the proximity of the Saturnalia to the winter solstice leads to an exposition of solar monotheism, the belief that the sun, or Sol Invictus, ultimately encompasses all divinities as one. The Saturnalia, which is the source of Christmas, was celebrated in honor of Saturn, the, or the origin of Santa. The holiday was celebrated with a sacrifice at the temple of Saturn. In the Roman Forum, and a public banquet followed by private gift-giving, continual partying, and a carnival atmosphere that overturned Roman social norms. Gambling was permitted, and masters provided table service for their slaves. A common custom was the election of a king of the Saturnalia, who would give orders to people and preside over the merrymaking. Eucharist the image depicts the Last Supper by Juan de Juanes. Effectively, Jesus became the dying God of the mysteries whose death and resurrection was celebrated every spring, known as Easter. Most of the churches had decided to observe Easter replacing the Jewish Passover. Easter, from the Greek Eorestes, or Astarte, the festival of death and resurrection was made to coincide with the spring rites of other contemporary cults excuse me, and mystery schools. The death and resurrection of Attis was officially celebrated at Rome on the 24th and 25th of March, the latter being regarded as the spring equinox, and therefore as the most appropriate day for the revival of the god of fertility who had been dead or sleeping throughout the winter. Similarly, other Christian holidays were assimilated to pagan festivals. The Festival of St. George in April replaced the ancient pagan festival of the Parilia. The Festival of St. John the Baptist in June has supplanted a midsummer festival of water. The Festival of the Assumption of the Virgin in August has ousted the Festival of Diana and the Feast of All Souls in November is a continuation of an old heathen feast of the dead. Christian authors like Justin Martyr and Tertullian noted the similarities between Christianity and the mysteries, but claimed that the mysteries were demonically inspired imitations of the true Christianity. The Eucharist was modeled was an adaption as an adaption of the cannibalism mysteries where the cup of the Last Supper is the mixing bowl or cup of the Mithraic and Dionysian mysteries, which holds the blood of the god. Originally mentioned in Plato's Timaeus, the cup is found in the Chaldean oracles, 
a Neoplatonic text of the second century AD, and is equated with the monad in the Corpus Hermeticum, and Zosimus in the fifth century refers to it as the symbol of spiritual baptism or initiation. To Justin Martyr, Jesus took bread and said, Do ye, this do ye in remembrance of me, this is my body. And after the same manner, having taken the cup and given thanks, he said, This is my blood, and gave it to them, which the wicked devils have imitated in the mysteries of Mithra, commanding the same thing to be done. Hmm. To Tertullian, washing is the channel through which they are initiated into the sacred rites of some notorious Isis or Mithras at the ap. Apollinarian and Eleusinian games, they are baptized, and they presume that the effect of their doing that is their regeneration, and the remission of the penalties due to their perjuries. Tertullian states that Mithras, in the kingdom of Satan, sets his marks on the forehead of his soldiers, celebrates also the oblation of bread, and introduces an image of resurrection. What also must we say to Satan's limiting his chief priest to a single marriage? He too has his virgins. He too his proficience in continence. Satan has shown such emulation in administration of Christ's sacraments that he succeeded in adapting to his profane and rival creed the very documents of divine things and of the Christian saints. Okay, Church Fathers, again, I believe. Dis uh, let's go back, or let's go down. Sorry. Despite the fact that early Christians rejected the teachings of Gnosticism as heresy, many of its ideas were eventually absorbed into the mainstream church. Christianity emerged at a time when the mysteries were at the height of their popularity. And though it rejected paganism outwardly, it absorbed several of its concepts, derived ultimately from the mysteries, rationalized by the early church fathers through their adherence to Neoplatonic philosophy. According to Anthony Buzzard, the mingling of Hebrew and Greek thinking was set in motion first in the second century by an influx of Hellenism through the church fathers, whose theology was colored by the Pla Platonists, Plotinus, and Porphyry. Essentially, as scholars have noted, traditional Christian orthodoxy, though claiming to derive its doctrine from authentic sources, is actually an amalgam of biblical themes and Neoplatonism. The rationalization of Christianity with Platonic philosophy was initiated by Justin Martyr, 165 AD, Justin's conversion, however, did not mean the abandonment of philosophical inquiry. On the contrary, he viewed Christianity as the true philosophy. The transcendent, incomprehensible God of Plato is the God of the Bible, and he surmised that the Jewish scriptures must have been made available to Plato and the Greek philosophers. The influence of Platonic philosophy becomes apparent in Justin Martyr's theology. He uses the concept of the divine logos to explain how the transcendent father of all deals with the inferior, created order of things. The son logos is necessary to mediate between the supreme father and the material world. The divine logos inspired the prophets and was present in Jesus Christ. Justin insists that the logos is other than the Father, derived from the Father in a process which does not diminish the being of the Father, but in a manner in which one torch may be lit from another. Clement of Alexandria, the great opponent of Gnosticism, was confident that because God had planted the seeds of truth in all men, there is much to be learned from Platonic metaphysics, from Stoic ethics, and from Aristotelian logic. There is little significant information about Clement's early life. Clement was converted to Christianity by his last teacher, reputedly a former Stoic philosopher, and the first recorded president 
of the Christian cata, sorry, cata, catechetical school, catechetical school at Alexandria. Clement succeeded his mentor as head of the school and became the intellectual leader of the Alexandria. Sorry, I lost my place because I almost sneezed. This book of, uh, yes, the book of Revelation contains material related to the Merkaba mysteries and harmonizes elements, as does Merkaba, from the books of Ezekiel, Daniel, and Isaiah. Passages from apocalyptic texts, including Enoch and Jubilees, refer to the establishment of a millennial kingdom by a messianic figure, though the actual number of years given for the duration of the kingdom varied. The concept was likely influenced by Zoroastrianism, which describes history as occurring in successive thousand-year periods, each of which culminates in the final destruction of evil by a triumphant messianic figure, the seo at the end of the last millennial age. Sorry, just one second. Okay, we're almost done here, too, I think. In Revelation 4, verses 6 to 8, four beasts that surround the one are seen in John's vision, which appear as a lion, an ox, a man, and an eagle, much as in the vision of Ezekiel. April D. DeConnick has suggested that John may have drawn from the literature of Merkaba mysticism. Comparing the creatures in Ezekiel with those in Revelations is a prominent apocalyptic study in Western Christianity. Good. William D. Mountsey noted a belief that the living creatures may have been associated with the four principal signs of the zodiac. The symbol of the combined four creatures is known as a tetramorph. The term is derived from the Greek tetra, meaning four, and morph, shape. Book of the art, real quick. A composition of the four living creatures from the book of Ezekiel into one tetramorph. Matthew the man, Mark the lion, Luke the ox, and John the eagle. Good. In Christian art, the tetramorph is the union of the symbols of the four evangelists derived from the four living creatures of the book of Ezekiel into a single figure, or more commonly, a group of four figures. Each of the four evangelists is associated with one of the living creatures, usually shown with wings. The most common association, but not the original or only, is Matthew the man, Mark the lion, Luke the ox, and John the eagle. <coughs> Traditionally, the writer of Revelation was widely considered to be John the Apostle, also known as St. John, who was also seen as author of the Gospel of John. Most scholars, however, now agree that John of Revelation is neither the author of the fourth gospel nor the Apostle John. Some have identified the author as John the Elder, and many modern scholars believe it was written by an otherwise unknown author, to whom they have given the name John of Patmos. All that is known is that John was a Jewish Christian prophet, probably belonging to a group of such prophets, and was accepted by the congregations to whom he addresses his letter. In the early 4th century AD, Eusebius listed the book of Revelation among the spurious texts. Jewish historians have long considered the book of Revelation to be a Jewish apocalypse in a Christian redaction. According to several studies, including a review by Dr. James Tabor and Dr. J. Massingbird Ford, the book of Revelation contains ancient, pre-Christian texts of Jewish origin dating back to the time of John the Baptist and the communities of the Dead Sea Scrolls, as well as antique Jewish texts. According to the Jewish Encyclopedia, John symbolized the call to repentance by baptism in the Jordan. And the same measure for attaining to holiness was employed by the Essenes, 
whose ways of life John also observed in all other respects. Eastern Christians became skeptical of the book as their doubts were reinforced by its acceptance by Montanists and other groups considered to be heretical. Montanism was an early Christian movement of the late second century named after its founder, Montanus. Some accounts claim that before his conversion to Christianity, Montanus was a priest of Apollo or Sibylle. Montanism was labeled a heresy for its belief in new prophetic revelations. Montanus believed he was a prophet of God and that the paraclete spoke through him. Montanus had two female colleagues, Prisca and Maximilla, who likewise claimed the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Their popularity even exceeded Montanus's own. Interesting. John the Apostle running out of the bathhouse from Cerinthus. Eusebius, in his church history, mentioned that the Apocalypse of John was, a, was accepted as canonical book as a canonical book and rejected at the same time. Revelation is counted as both accepted and disputed, which has caused some confusion over what exactly Eusebius meant by doing so. The disputation can perhaps be attributed to Origen. Origen seems to have accepted it in his writings. Cyril of Jerusalem does not name it among the canonical books. Athanasius, Augustine of Hippo, and Tyrannius Rufinius, Ruf Rufinius all listed the revelation of John the Evangelist as a canonical book. Eusebius also reported that Dionysus, the bishop of Alexandria and disciple of Origen, wrote that the book of Revelation could have been written by Cerinthus, a Gnostic who was widely considered a heretic by the early church fathers. Cerinthus taught that Jesus would establish a thousand-year reign of sensuous pleasure after the second coming but before the resurrection, and a view that was declared heretical by the Council of Ni Nicaea. The Elogi, a second or third century heretical Christian sect, alleged Cerinthus was the true author of the Gospel of John and Book of Revelation. Caius, a Christian author who lived about the beginning of the third century, mentioned by Hippolytus, stated that Revelation was a work of Cerinthus. Early Christian tradition describes Cerinthus as a contemporary to and opponent of John the Evangelist, who may have written the fourth gospel to counter his heretical teachings. Contrary to the church fathers, he used the gospel of Cerinthus and denied that the supreme God made the physical world. To Cerinthus, as is common in Gnostic thought, the God of the Bible is the creator of this world, and therefore it is Lucifer who is the supreme God. Thus, explained Albert Pike, Cerinthus of Ephesus, with most of the Gnostics, Philo, the Kabbalah, and <coughs> the Zend Avesta, the Puranas, and all the Orient, deemed the distance and antipathy between the supreme being and the material world too great to attribute to the former the creation of the latter. This Oriental tradition, which was found in the Book of Revelation, Pike further explained, formed the basis of the teachings preserved by Freemasonry. <clears throat> that ends this chapter. So that was the Book of Revelation, the fourth chapter of Volume 1 of David Livingstone's Ordo Ab Chao. The next chapter will be Gog and Magog. We'll begin there in the next video. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.